Ooh. Hello, my name is Henry Barajas, and I am the director of operations at Top Cow Productions. And I am I feel like a kid in a candy store, and I'm so lucky to have these amazing creators in the same space for the first time, and nobody can remember. Uh, let's first uh, introduce the the founder of Top Cow, Mark Silvestri. Hey, Mark. Hey, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> And we also have David Wool, one of the amazing architects. Yay. Hi. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thank, got, you. thank you for, for coming. Uh, and we also got another amazing, just one of the people that's been in the, uh, with Image for, since everything started, Brian Haberlin. So hey, Brian. Yay, Brian. <laughs> another old man. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. And one of the key writers of Witchblade that everyone always loves to to give you a shout out on the on the internet and we got christina z well thank you again for um coming together for this is the this month is the 25 year anniversary of witchblade and uh i you know all are really old <laughs> where is the time gone <laughs> <laughs> i know how much how much that makes you feel when i say that um oh, yeah. so i i just uh no i mean yeah big fan since i was a kid and it's an honor to to be a part of the company so let's start from the beginning i know we did a a cool interview for the witchblade 25th anniversary facsimile edition that came out a couple months ago and we had uh christina and david and, and matt hawkins in long beach uh, at a time yeah, thanks for doing that guys yeah it was it was a safe event, so I'm I'm glad everybody came out of it alive. So, uh, let's let's go back to the beginning and uh, walk walk me through how Witchblade started. And it, it sounded like it all started during a lunch in Santa Monica. <laughs> yeah, you know, I got the worst memory, so you guys are probably well. <laughs> it was it started just out of hubris, really. At the end of the day, uh, you know, it was just we saw that you know. Billy was doing great with She, and we saw that Brian was doing great with Lady Death, and Top Cow, we all, which Top Cow was a smaller, people could fit in a room, uh, and we said, let's do our, our version. Let's, let's, uh, let's up the ante, or try to up the ante anyway. And that was the basic original idea, was that we were gonna do our version of yeah. Male Hero, and make her believable, you know, at the same time. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, go ahead, David. Go ahead. And, uh, and we were both really into uh, Michael Moorcock's Stormbringer yeah. and, uh, and like the idea of a sentient weapon as uh, uh, something we could put into a, like a modern day story. Yep. And, I, and I just remember like sitting in that, whatever it was on the Santa Monica Pier. Santa Monica Pier. Mark, Mark had created an environment like, like, you know, where we could just hang out and uh, try to create new concepts. You know, I thought that was one of the coolest things about Top Cat was that, you know, like back when I first started, we would like kind of lounge by the pool and be like, you know, let's talk about this and talk about that. <laughs> and, uh, and just see what comes of it, you know? And, um, and that's pretty much what we were doing when we got to Santa Monica, you know, we would just spend time trying to think of what would be a cool concept and throw spaghetti at the refrigerator and see what stuck. Originally, she was going to be a fireman. Remember that? I do remember that, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but then, um, we thought, then we realized that cops give us more shows or more stories that we can more make. more yeah more real life cases of where she would intermingle with reality and crime, but you know like they did with the X Files, yeah, you, it's there's more to it, right? It's yeah. like there's she sees much more. Like my favorite reference for for stuff like this is always like They Live, my one of my favorite guilty yeah. pleasure movies, right? And it's like you suddenly are able to see all this kind of crap that nobody else can see. And that was always my favorite part of Sarah's burden, yeah, you know, as the Witchblade Bear. But I remember it's like, um, yeah, that's where, and here's some great Michael Turner art, and this, you know, you know, rest in peace. And and I remember when you know Mike did the um, ballistic miniseries. Yep. And we were kind of going, all right, this guy, this guy, <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> he's going, you know, and uh, with uh, Brad Foxhoven, we were talking about, you know, and David and I, I think you were there too at the same time, um, about, okay, I guess it's time to make this guy a star, you know, and we need, we got this idea, and it was kind of, we were thinking of it specifically for Mike, with Mike in mind, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Mike and I just finished the mini, that mini series. Yeah. And it was, was like great. He, he had, and he, that's when he totally jumped, you know? Mm -hmm. 
but he was great. He's like the example I give to so many young artists is that Mike attacked, besides having talent, of course, yeah. but Mike attacked being an artist like you do an athlete. Because he used to do kickboxing, right? So he knew about training. He knew about all this stuff. And he would just be, when I would show him stuff, like Kiyosamiya, things that weren't in his reference, you know, that kind of, he would just... He was fearless. He was fearless. Suck it in and use it. Suck it in and use it. He never, and, and this is something that's very, um, you know, Christina is a writer, you know, you, you, and David, and you guys feel this as well. It's no different than being, you know, the, the graphic end of it. You're just a creative person. You know, we all suffer from crippling self-doubt. You know, I don't <laughs> care how many years you've been in it. You know, you still go, holy shit. You know, I, like I'm still doing stuff now and I go, I don't know how to draw when I hit the drawing board. I, I don't know how to draw. You know, I draw 40 some years in the business. I don't know what I'm doing. And then it comes in, but Mike never suffered from that, which was really unusual. Right. It's like I've never met anyone who's simply like, like you pointed out, Brian, it's like, it didn't matter. He just attacked it. You know, it was a problem to solve. He assumed and, he'd figure it out. Yeah. It was just going to happen. <laughs> right. And it just did. And that was just like an amazing mindset that he had. Um, well, he loved, you know, just always receiving like any reference that we would give him. And, you know, going back to like the beginning is again, when you were saying like there was she and Lady Death. And I remember just all of us talking like and, and going in line with the sort of uh, Stormbringer and the Elric kind of thing is we wanted something that, you know, a character that wasn't always going to be just on top of the world and always happy and always beating everything and winning, always winning. We wanted something that was darker, that was a little morose, that, that would also instill this kind of doubt in a character that you could sort of empathize and, and relate to um, because so many of the characters at that time were just out of this world perfect. They were all just suddenly perfect. And so Sarah Pizzini, you know, and I just remember that with all of us thinking like, yeah, let's let's make her vulnerable, you know. And and I know Mike, he just loved that, and he dug that, and he was just able to convey that emotion onto her so well, you know. And that's and that's really, I think, what the true lasting appeal has been. It's not necessarily. I mean, the Witchblade, yes, because it's cool to get this this wish fulfillment and all that stuff. But it was Sarah, right? And um, the way that you guys gave her that voice and that reality. Right, which easily allow the reader to bridge, you know, the real Sarah into the, the hyper real world of the Witchblade. And I remember in conversations with Mike when we were, you know, visually trying to get the cues right, and trying to figure out what she looked like and and all that. And he always was focused, which I thought was really cool. And I and looking backwards, you can kind of see where that's. I I do think that's where the lasting appeal has been. He was always focused on how she looked every day, like what she would wear when she was hanging around the house, right? Mm -hmm. Or when she was just out doing her thing. And that would be Sarah, right? And I thought, wow, that's just, I, 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 up until that point, you know, especially since the excess of the 90s and <laughs> image comics, no one ever really considered that to be the most important part of the book was how that person looked normally. Right? Well, yeah, we would bring, um... Uh, catalogs of like just there's like clothing I had a blast doing that you know and there were times where we would do that and say let's go to Barnes and Noble and and just go to the magazine section and, and get like you know like fashion magazines and that was I thought was so cool too with Mike is is that up until then you know a lot of the characters if they were wearing um, a co costume they could be pretty much naked with just a line drawn here and a line drawn here and here. Costume. And, and it, it is a costume. It's a costume right there. And maybe put on some heels and suddenly if you color that in, right, Extra as Brian knows, it's a costume. Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, that was also too one of the things in the very beginning, you know, when I met David, where I was like, I saw so many comics that just didn't have. And then when you, Mark, I saw you putting quotes quilting you put quilting on clothing the actual quilting on designs and it was just it was gorgeous it was amazing and nobody was really making this beautiful clothing design and i know mike obviously worshipped you oh. and and took so much of of that and then i showed him like high fashion designers like christian dior or yves saint laurent and he just was like whoa 
what? You know, <laughs> women get to wear this, you know? <laughs> and I think that that crazy element of just, I guess, all these people coming together with those, you know, designs and ideas kinetically made this thing happen. Yeah. And correct me if I'm wrong, everybody. Christina, that was like, that's You're like wrong. perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but was there, I, looking back, and again, my memory isn't what it should be, but I don't remember any of us not being on the same page. Was that the case? Or am I just imagining things? Like during the whole process of creating it and all that, was there any point where, where there was like, no, that sucks. Don't do that. That's a horrible idea. No, I think I early on. That. Early on, it was definitely, it, it all flowed like really well. And, um, you know, I mean, it even, yeah, cause that process, you know, of coming up with ideas for like uh, irons, you know, or like like how we wanted to do the villains and things like that. It seemed like, yeah, all of us were pretty much on the same page in, in, in what we wanted, what envelopes we wanted to push and, and how, you know, how we wanted to make it cool. Yeah. Um, and then I think, I think we were all also good at throwing out what didn't work, you know, like, like if uh, if Christina told me something was weak and and you know needed to be stronger because it was boring, like I probably would fight it a little bit, you know, knowing <laughs> the me of that year, probably I would have been. Well, you two had that mysterious working relationship. It's like we all did. I mean, it was. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think about being a member in the studio on the Third Street Promenade, and people would sleep on the couch yes. remember just couches there would just i mean just Peter everybody just Brian, on the floor every, yeah. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, couch, the couch was taken it was all night long it was like an all night long weird party was there great. was food was there great. was you know we like, had a band marathon a band i've not heard this we had Please. a band marathon it was oh the game the marathon the first sort of network computer games Oh, yeah. that's right. That's what it was I, called. Yeah. I, I was still leave, in San Diego, I, right? I would leave the studio at, in, in the evening because I kept like a regular sort of working hours kind of thing and come loser. back in the morning. Loser. And Brandon, <laughs> Mark Brandon and Peter and stuff would still be over their computers playing <laughs> the night before. <laughs> oh, man. I remember that. It was like, um, and kind of circling back around to David, what you said about, you know, the environment, right? It's like, yeah, there was, there was some screwing around, but for the most part, the entire atmosphere, all the oxygen in that room was, you know, had creative molecules in it, you know, because we were all like part of that club, you know, and at that point, um, it, the, 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 just the act of creation, right, was addiction, right? It, it's like you couldn't get away from it and you didn't want to get away from it. And it was all around. It was all very, it was a positive force. It was, a, it was like you were getting struck by lightning. <laughs> we won't talk about that, but for the most part, it was right. just like this place that encouraged new ideas. And I remember that every, every aspect of Witchblade from uh, the early creative um, meetings that we had, just figuring out what, you know, what the Witchblade was, who Sarah was, and like Brian said, it, well, she was a fireman at one point, you know, um, and figuring all that out, all the way through to what I still consider today as being one of the best launches of a new book ever, right? You know, and, and I think Brad Foxwell had a lot to do with that as well, and the people that we had in marketing back then, and we had a pretty good marketing department. But I thought the lead up to Witchblade coming out I, I've never seen anything better than that, you know, and it worked. But I yeah, think like all the aspects. time in the industry, like we weren't part of Image when Witchblade number one came out. Oh that was the time God. that we were that we were like separate for a that less than a limited amount of time. And we still launched Witchblade as the number one book at a time when we weren't part of Image. Were we already out? Yeah, we were just. How was that? We it, was like, how it, was, that it was like a one month period, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, it was close. Really the launch of Witchblade number one was it, and. Uh, and then we went back in for the by the second. How did month. we get the cover to previews though? Because that's a, that was exclusive. Well, there. So from my research, there was multiple distributors, and then that's when Diamond started. So when the book launched, all these distributors were going out of business. Oh, so the Diamond the exclusivity deal was after the launch of Witchblade. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because well, we. Been... Um... Go ahead, Christian. Oh Go ahead. no no it's nothing. Uh, I was just gonna say um, I've been contacted by a few people. And they, the, one of the questions that they always ask is like, or they deduce from all that, they're like, you guys are all pretty twisted people. And I was, you know, I had to think back and I was like, well, maybe that also added to the thing. Cause right when number one came out and when everything was going on, yeah. 
You no, know? I mean, yeah, I think twisted. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to look back at that and consider it a compliment. <laughs> I do. You know, I, I look. Because yeah. 25 years later, if someone's still calling me twisted, I have issues. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think well, getting, back then we were all what, really excited. Getting back to what you mentioned before, Mark, and it started for me because I started when we were down at Amish, you know, yeah, from and, almost and the day Top one, Cow yeah. had the same vibe, but we were more really on the same team because then we really were, you know, when I first joined in 93 uh, in homage, everybody in that play space was out to beat everybody else technique wise, style wise, yeah. speed wise, whatever it was. But also the most important thing was I was taught there, which does not exist in the industry anymore, is that it's everybody's job along the line to improve the product. Right. For sure. That was our mantra back then. You know, God. I still will always remember when you there was when you and Cynthia went away to I think a Hawaii vacation, and you had just finished Cyberforce Five. You made like you made a, you made a jump at Cyberforce Five yourself. You know, Paul, just you made a jump. You know, that's probably and, when Scott Williams started inking me. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently Alex Garner inked one of those pages. So. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> And my 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 computer desk was right down the aisle from your 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 art desk in your little area. And, and David, you know, everybody would put up like when Mark would put his pencil, he'd tack it on the wall. It'd go <laughs> off to to Scott and JD and 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 everybody, and oh, okay. it'd be replaced by the Xerox of the inked and you know oh, whatever. Yeah. And I remember after you left in the evening one time, Jim Lee went into your your area when you weren't there, and he's looking up at the wall, and he's looking at all the pages. <laughs> And he does this. <laughs> <laughs> Did he say uh, fun? Uh, yeah, fun. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's and that's yeah. You know, that's it's always good to hear, especially you know, for someone like Jim. It's like, oh crap! You, know, you, you, you don't really believe it when you hear that kind of stuff, but you know, awesome. Yeah, but the, it's true. I mean, the, the competition was always forward moving and positive even if it seemed like like smack talk and negativity it it wasn't you know it was everyone just kind of acknowledging that everyone else was literally bringing their a game every single day yeah you know? well, and i don't think a lot of people know how many people i mean mark used to have i mean just and again it doesn't exist anymore right. but mark had this farm club mentality that he would bring in young artists and let them develop. And when I was first there, you know, Joe Benitez had just been there for a, for a little bit. Uh, Dave Finch just came in. Billy Tan. Yeah, who, Billy Tan. Yeah. You know, and 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 none of them had jobs to do. Their job was to come in the studio and draw and, and learn, learn how to draw better. Yeah, and learn yeah. how to draw. And their their job was still, to go to school. And they're all still top yeah. of the pyramid guys. Yeah. You know, and that that's from you know across the board too. I mean, how many? To talk about the staff of my coloring department, you know, no slouches there. God, no one of those people coloring, you know, a book for you, you know, yeah. and, and the anchors we have. It was funny. Remember, remember Billy got to the point when he first, he got to be as good as Scott at inking so fast, but he wanted to be a penciler Shh, so Don't tell Stolen Scott here. <laughs> he heard me say that. Before. He knows too. Yeah. But he got really awesome at yeah. inking. And but he so wanted to be a penciler, he just kept focusing. Well, he was an artist, and all the best yeah. inkers are they have drawing skills. Well, right? I, I, that's, but that was the same thing with my colorists. I hired yeah. painters. Well, remember when we had that conversation um, yeah. back then? It's like because we were kind of trying to figure out computer coloring. Mean, we're digressing, I know. No, please. Um, no, I mean this is all this is all really yeah. important, I think, to Top Cow and Witchblade. Yeah. You know, going back to a kind of sets it up. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, the greatest, I think some of the best working <laughs> artists right now have come from the Top Cow studio and that farm mentality. Yeah, and we still had that farm mentality uh, going into when we were doing Witchblade. I mean, the market was changing back then. But I remember, you know, just real quick what Brian was saying, it's um, we had that conversation about how to make the coloring next level, right? And I think, I don't remember, I don't remember how it led up to this, but I remember the end result of this conversation that we had. Um, instead of finding computer people and teaching them how to color, let's find painters and teach them how to use computers, yeah. right? And I think that's what changed the dynamic of how coloring was done. 
because it was and, easy and, to teach people a new paintbrush as opposed to teaching people that knew how to use a computer how to paint. You know, and that's how we helped kill color guidance. <laughs> oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> well, like still, I mean, a lot of them would just switch from one to the other, right? It just some did, <laughs> yeah, most did. You know, a couple didn't. The uh, good ones. I was like scratch my head. I was like, don't you want to try to use a computer? Like, no, nope. Like you know, everybody <laughs> else is, right? Don't care. <laughs> Whatever. So going on in the, the farm kind of thing, the one thing I definitely do remember, and it's definitely a witch play thing, but it was also like the top cow thing. It's like, yeah, there were so many people. Like we were all so, so young and so completely naive. And, and, and when deadlines would come around, I mean, I, I did have like jobs before and certainly had jobs obviously after, but... I don't think anything can set any person up like the intensity of when deadlines at Top Cow were hitting. And, 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 and I mean, I have to give the credit to like David for just like cracking that whip and saying, this has to get done or else. <laughs> and you know, it just goes because you're having such a great time in Except the studio. Except when it came to me. Well, yeah, okay, right. And David, you hated, you hated what, that job. Good or bad, it was your, it was your it. fault, David. Right? Yeah. yeah, but I mean, that, but it never, you know, that never left. And I, I, I will never be late for anything. That's the one thing now I can say is I am prompt. I will never, never miss a deadline. And, and that's because as, much fun as we all had in the studio and as crazy as people just you know blasting the music and joking around and writing and just doing crazy stuff in there that we all did it was like man when when it was time to just do that it was a it was like going to war it was a whole different yeah. world and and then and then it got done which was the most amazing thing like boom it was amazing yeah. you know yeah that's true back then we guaranteed the shipping so we had to we, yeah we did we had to get <laughs> a was, of stuff for a while we had guaranteed shipping Thing, right oh yeah. my god yeah so we couldn't miss right so because everything would be returnable and that would be bad but no matter how much we messed around at the beginning <laughs> at the end there it's like <laughs> and it's like and i think that's the creative mentality anyway so that that was the weird way that creativity and commerce kind of blended you know and it was unavoidable where you know it's like as creative people writers artists whatever it is it's like you, you kind of you don't have a sense of time like most people do you know because your brain is working when it wants to work and you kind of go with the flow, right? You go with that moment and that flow doesn't always jive with the deadline. So suddenly, often, you know, somebody like David would mention, oh, guys, you know, we, we have an issue to do and there's, we're a week out from printing. <laughs> 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 and suddenly, because we were all a team, right? Suddenly everyone, like Christina, like you said, it's like we just, it would click and come together. And I don't know about you guys, but still today, you know, when I suddenly realize, oh, I have to finish this by tomorrow, whatever that is, uh, the brain clears, right? And any fear you have of whatever you're about to do kind of disappears, and it gets replaced by the fact that it just has to get done. But you need that short span of time. Like, it's very hard for creative people to think months in advance, uh, even weeks in advance, days, it starts to, like, click. <laughs> it starts to matter. But, yeah. Those are panicky times. And when we did Witchblade, um, I don't remember, maybe you guys do that. Were we behind the eight ball schedule wise on those first issues or were we, were we pretty good? I don't remember. No, we were behind the eight ball because, because uh, Mike had, uh, had just finished Ballistic, like, or he even gave up the third issue, right? He gave up like some of the third issue to start on Witchblade, but it was already, it was already into the summer when we started it and we had until, you know, the book came out in October. So I, I'm pretty sure that the first issue was definitely under a gun that first issues normally aren't under. You're right, because I actually had to help him on some of those pages. And the cover, right? Like, I think you inked him. No, I don't, I don't think I inked any of those covers, but I, I, I drew some backgrounds for him on that first issue. So yeah, no, we were in trouble. <laughs> we can't go. When I got to get pulled in and draw some stuff, we're in trouble. <laughs> when I become the guy to help, that's bad. Yeah, no, I remember that. <laughs> was that, and then it was just always like that? Yeah, it was, it was pretty. It a lot. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I'll point the finger at me, and it was a big part yeah. of it. <laughs> so <will> we. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely, I think we, uh, that was one of those projects that uh, we were sort of like uh, moonlighting, you know, like uh, we would always do it at the last minute, and then, uh, and then it would get done, and people liked it. 
you, you, I mean, you give us, you give us a, you give off that Bruce Willis vibe. I do. Yeah, yeah. For you kids that don't know what the hell we're talking about, that was it was, a, it was a show like forty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> that was where Bruce Willis started his acting career on TV. Yeah, you damn kids. <laughs> well, that's no, so, you know, it's it's funny, but uh, looking back on those times, and all of us can attest to the fact that in this industry, there, even when it was feast. Uh, there was never calm, <laughs> right? So there was always levels of chaos. Uh, either you were doing great and there was chaos or you're doing bad and there was chaos. You know, depending on where the market was, it didn't matter. You know, there was still, there was no guarantees of anything at any point, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, you know, I remember when, when Witchblade just burst on the scene, right? We were all like crazy happy. At, but at the same time, it was all like, oh, crap. You know, the market around us, if I remember correctly, was collapsing, right? It was shifting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, was wasn't that when the big collapse was happening, right, when, in that 90s area? Well, it was over, like, years, yeah, but, but yeah, we were definitely in the midst of it then. I mean, I think right. it started in, like, 94, and then, uh, so it probably was, yeah, going over time before it resettled. Because I remember when Witchblade, um, Witchblade became kind of not just our benchmark book, for how the market was doing. I mean, Spawn was always the benchmark book, if I remember correctly. It was number one for- Yeah, if Spawn was okay, we all looked at those numbers of Spawn, right? And it's like, if those were okay, then we were all okay. And for us personally, it was Witchblade, right? And I remember there was a point, because the market was steadily coming down and nobody could stop it. You know, the numbers were just coming down. And I remember, because we were selling, I don't remember, David, do you remember the first, or Brian, do you remember the first numbers? It was like 90, 95. I think I sent those to you, Henry. No, yeah. they, were, they were high. They were higher than that. The first one was they like were, 170. Right? I think. It was, yeah. It was, but, that yeah. Had, but that had some incredible. Uh, okay. Like, it, yeah, it sold, sold approximately 125,000. Oh, the first one? Yeah. I think it was higher than that. Well, I think it was probably. You know, it was, it was probably gigantic. It, it was one of those through diamond. Kind of, like it started at a really good place, but it, it did this, you know? Yeah, it went up, right? If I'm not yeah. mistaken. It, it did it go up. It started out well, then it went up. And then I remember we were having conversations because then everything started to come down. And it's like our number of like, oh crap, was like 70. Like we hadn't gotten there yet, but we were looking at that number. It's like, wow, if we ever hit 70,000 like Witchblade, you know, that's not good. You know, eventually we hit 70,000 <laughs> and worse. But that was also at a weird time for all publishers in that as the market was falling, you know, and you know, Witchblade elevated us and then the dark was following that. You know, we were comparatively doing better than most, you know. Um, yeah. But the market numbers were falling, but the cost of making the books weren't falling with it. And that was the problem. Yeah. Because you know, the cost of making those books was still the early image days. You know, so it's like, oh crap, we're not selling those numbers anymore. It took us yeah, a and time. nice office space on the Third Street Promenade. That's not, you know. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's not, it's not, it's not two floors in La Jolla, so you know, your no. mistake was less. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Overhead. Yeah. That's uh, that's that was a long learned lesson. <laughs> So I remember when it was getting obviously huge and huge and huge and at shows, like, I don't know if you guys got this or if I did just because I was the girl, but like other girls would be like, you're not going to have her like now that it's like this, you, she's not going to be dressed that way anymore. Right. She's not going to, you're not going to dress her like this. You're not going to write her like this and, and have her dressed and be this like, you know, because again, at that time, it was like you either had like the super heroine who was just like, again, like a lady death, or you had something that was, I don't know, somebody always in jeans and a t shirt and, and nothing else. And yeah, and, I mean, that's how that was hard to find in the 90s, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. And I was like, no, we're right, we're doing both. And I, and Mike, you know, I mean, and so much of everything on Top Cow, we, there was just that sexiness that I dug that just, you know, and it, it just worked. And, yeah, um, there's a formula that lasted for quite a while. Yeah, I mean, times change and we were changing with those times, obviously, but back then, yeah, that was just, um, I, I mean, Wonder Woman wasn't even a thing. 
right? Uh, DC wasn't even trying with Wonder Woman. So the, and no, that's why Warner Brothers was like taking a shot with Witchblade for a TV show rather than going with their own. Uh, yeah, right. Properties at that point. Yeah, Marvel didn't try, so it was just you know it was Billy and it was Brian uh, with Lady Death, and uh, it was us doing the the, the, the female lead comics you know even after which play was a success i don't believe that dc or marvels i don't think they still tried at that point no the only the only place you could yeah. go at that time and get that kind of content was in europe french yeah yeah french yeah comics and stuff they had leads lady margo and uh, a bunch of other, and, and and even anime i mean not manga but manga yeah for so sure it did not exist in the american market at that time yeah and and you know which played certainly because it was the most mainstream out of you know the female lead books it was proving the fact that there's an audience there and there was an audience waiting for that like christina you mentioned you know the excuse me you know the female audience was not being served at all in fact there was barely any female audience in comics back then um which is probably why marvel and dc ignored it you know um but yeah i remember the shows back then and you know it was like really great to see how happy we were making right this and, and that that right? women would really dig it and women yeah. did dig it and everyone they said did. that they wouldn't yeah. and i remember telling david like oh my gosh people i remember telling him like people you know it sucks because again it was like the first time you get this like hardcore criticism but from like your peers or even fans that are, are also women and, and of course even guys and he's like don't pay attention don't read that. Don't even pay attention to it at all. Look at the sales and that will dictate what people are into. And that taught me so much where I was like, yes, okay. But like, I'm so glad we didn't change that. And I, and I never ever wanted to. And I'm so glad that nobody said, yeah, okay, we have to cave in and make this like, you know, cause it was at that time, you know, the first of its kind. There, there just wasn't anything like it at all that had an intelligent, powerful, sexy, vulnerable, just the whole thing, you know? Yeah. And it was a, always, it was very encouraging to see all the women in line, yeah. you know, who just loved the character, right? And it's like, and that was really when, you know, it was before, obviously before the big paradigm shift at conventions, you know, now it's like 50, 50. And so if you look oh. at some stats, it's more women show up now you know, than men in some places. And it's like, that's a wonderful thing. Um, and I like to think that we were kind of at the forefront of some of that, you know. Yeah. Um, and certainly when other media hit, um, you know, it, that brought in a whole generation of people, you know, that weren't necessarily comic fans before, you know. Um, when the Witchblade TV show hit, um, I don't recall us getting much of a benefit publishing from that show. Like today you would, right? Obviously you look at The Walking Dead, right? And there's reverse engineering there where the show does affect sales of the graphic novels. But, it, but that's, a, that's a weird thing because, you know, um, you know I've been neck, neck deep in retailer relationships for a decade now and stuff. And, and like when Supergirl came out, the TV series did not help. Oh, you froze up. I think You're we, still there? Yeah, we... He was saying that um, Supergirl wasn't uh, pushing the needle for the comic, unfortunately. Uh, I, I think it's, it's important for us to mention uh, the retailer space. And if it weren't for retailers, Witchblade oh. wouldn't be as big as it is now. So oh, yeah. was there any particular retailers? Or Oh, we got Brian back. Oh, I think. Sort of. Hey, you were oh. saying you, you, we, we last left you with, uh, with Supergirl. Brian, you look like bad stop motion animation right now. <laughs> oh, I know he's gone. <laughs> we'll just look at David. Hi, David. <laughs> yeah, I think um, uh, he's for bad. sure. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, if it weren't for retailers, you know, they were just as important as fans uh, in getting this done. Brian, the question was, um, since you you were hooked in with the retailer market, like how, what was the what was the impact from that uh, side of it that really helped which way blow up? retailer side well i mean they they uh, i mean no matter how many people may argue about this they're not dumb <laughs> so they, saw, they they saw that there was still a void in the market and it fit that void perfectly i mean it had 
you know, it had style, it had sexiness, it had intelligence, you know, it had characters that you wanted to hang out with, you know. The weirdest thing, though, for me in Witchblade is that my college roommate became the villain in the TV show. With, you know, <laughs> right. Oh so tell that story real quick for people what? who don't know. Tell that story. <laughs> my, my, my college roommate at Loyola uh, was uh, Anthony Sestaro. And what? Anthony was an actor. Right, right. And, 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 uh, and we were top cow, whatever, and I get, and, 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 you know, I, I get a call. Hey, I just landed a, a, a lead in a new TV series. Oh, really? What is it? Which play? <laughs> <laughs> I'm playing Irons, the, the, the villain. <laughs> yeah. It's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, no connection, no, you know, at all. It's just, but there is a connection. Yeah. That, and, and by the way, one of the nicest guys you're ever going to Oh, meet. nice. He's a yeah. Just a really nice guy. And I remember the casting. I was sitting on the casting and all those things. And uh, he was um, he was one of those immediate choices. I'm like, that's the guy, right? <laughs> that's Irons. Is there's no like, uh, maybe this guy, maybe this guy. Is like, when he read it, that was, that's Irons. There you go, done. I have an early plot from David where we didn't have the name set yet. And he was Franz Klammer. <laughs> 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 is he a skier? That's a skier. Well, it was a it was a placeholder name. No, that's a <laughs> skier. David no, no, knows this. Not, no, it I know it's, it was a placeholder name, name, though. It was just yeah. names that I throw in there. I think that's because <laughs> that's because Len Wein suggested that he be German. He was Len a skier? <laughs> was was Len? No, Len was in a little after that. He was after. He well, he came in like while we were trying to figure out like some stuff for Witchblade number one. So he took part in a couple of meetings. Just no, a little... I, I, no, you're wrong. I, re, I remember it was later. And, no, and, I, and I remember the, the helmet. The that tr- was for the cover for issue five we were talking about. It was. They wanted the axe and, oh, nice and memory, the Nazi thing and, and, and <laughs> the, the rich blade to be in the foreground like this. And uh, see, and my we all kind of. Not... Yeah, a lot of, people don't, a lot of people don't remember this, but Len Wing was editor in chief. Yeah, a, RIP. A yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was around, was he there for Darkness too? I no. Don't remember. I don't think so. No. It was already uh, done. It was already out. Okay. And yeah, a lot of people don't realize that we launched the Darkness out of which played. And Darkness was actually created the first. Well, yeah. I mean, that was when I when I was first joined you guys in ninety three when we would go out and talk about stuff, there was this thing called the Darkness. Yeah. <laughs> in 93. <laughs> when, did, when did Peter come up with that logo? It's still one of my favorite logos for the darkness. I like the Witchblade logo too, but he did all our logos, didn't he? Or, yeah. or did Dennis? Yeah, probably Dennis no, may Peter, have done something, but Peter I think Mike Heiser did the original ones. Oh, Mike Heiser. I don't think sorry. Dennis did any. Uh, yeah, Mike and Mike. Mike. I meant Mike, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I think he did the darkness probably right after Witchblade, because uh, it was probably for when we needed to, to launch it in, in Witchblade. Uh, nine and ten uh yeah. that's when we had the darkness zero crossover well, that's, thing. that's when that's when I, it was it was actually that thing i just showed the spawn 25 when you guys all swapped the mm-hmm. the creator image creators swapped their titles when mark realized that you know a single character book is easier to do than a team book <laughs> <laughs> and that's when things started really kind of rolling for yeah let's get more darkness kind of going you know yeah, that's one guy i can do that yeah, <laughs> I think I screwed up that deadline immediately too. So. And then you also had to. We also put in the Darklings, which totally ruined that. Oh, yeah, that ruined the whole idea. <laughs> I love the Darklings though. I but was, uh, they were, yeah, they're so I, cute. <laughs> yeah, it's like I love those guys. But I, I remember when I um, first was pitching you guys the idea of the darkness, and it was in San Diego. Yeah. yeah. Um, that because I you know, I grew up on horror movies and and fantasy, right? And it's, it's like I thought that would be like just really cool to kind of take the Dracula mythos and turn it into a superhero guy. You know, with those limitations, right? When the dawn comes up, he's screwed, all right? So, um, but what is, what was the issue? Was it issue 10 of which played where Jackie makes his Yeah, parents? it was nine and 10. Nine yeah. and 10, oh, it was two issues? Yeah, I think so. Oh, okay. Do you remember? I, I can't one. remember. I don't is it just 10? I, I, I feel like it was 10. 10. I, th- I think it was 10. I don't think it was nine, I can't. Because I have the guys, scripts, so. You guys wrote them as like the superpowered. Yeah. Oh right, nine was nine was Anne Bonnie, so yeah, it must have been ten. Yeah, yeah, okay, but yeah, which played was like still so successful at that point that it seemed it was an easy decision to make to launch a character out of there. Plus, the darkness was supernatural, and which played was already established as supernatural. You know, so 
was for you guys as, as writers, right? Because um, we talked about like Sarah, the character in real life, and then Sarah, the wielder of the witchblade. Um, what did you like writing better, or did they just cross over constantly? Did you like the fantasy aspects of witchblade, or did you like the reality aspect of witchblade as writers? Gosh, I mean, I I think. It, it was like the merge of the two because there was always one or the other. You know what I mean? And I mean, that's such a cool question, but it, it's definitely integrating the two because it almost seemed like a taboo thing to do. Like, wait a minute. Cause you know, there was that one scene where Mike actually drew her in like jeans and a t-shirt and she's got the witch blade. And it was just like, what? You know, it was, it was just so not happening at the time, but I mean, yeah, I, I think I remember telling David, like, I, one of the first comics I remember picking up, I can't remember what it was, but it was, it was so completely unrealistic because this, this woman goes into a store and she's like, I'm going to buy the most expensive and luxurious makeup there could be ever. And then it was, she, she's the artist, I don't know who it was, are holding up a compact of powder and it said cover girl. And I'm like, that's just drugstore, <laughs> like $2, you know, like let's make something that has that realism of somebody just going to the store every day and doing something, but accurately, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then she walks out and something supernatural happens and I don't know. It, it's for some reason right today, it doesn't seem like it's that much of a stretch because so many television shows and comics have followed that. Right. But you remember nobody, again, that wasn't happening. So, you know. Yeah, I, I remember the, like, the same thing. Like, I remember like, doing the thing at the Statue of Liberty and uh, mm -hmm. like having like the Witchblade power activating and killing people at the Statue of Liberty just in this like, totally like, uh, <laughs> like environment, you know, where Mike is drawing it like really accurately or trying to, and then like suddenly the Witchblade is doing its weird stuff in there. And uh, so that was really cool. Like, that's why I thought New York was such a good setting for it, you know, just to, uh, to, to have these like recognizable. Yeah, that is something, but in the beginning, that's definitely something we discussed. Yeah. Are you going to be an LA based person? Yeah. Was she going to be, you know? You know, people complain about New York being overused, but it's like, of course it is because everyone wants to go. Every, that, it just, it clicks, right? It's like trying to take Batman out of Gotham, right? It just doesn't work because Gotham just works. You know, New York works for everything because New York is everything, right? You've got your tall buildings, you've got your small neighborhoods, you've got your good areas, you've got your bad areas. There's no limitations to it. And everyone recognizes New York, right? Yeah. And everyone accepts New York. So, and then we still get this when we, when we pitch projects for TV and stuff like this. So where's it gonna take place? You know, New York is so used. Like, people love but, it. Yeah. They get it. You know, oh, let's put it in San Francisco or whatever. I love San Francisco, but do I wanna see this character over there? No. <laughs> <laughs> see, because anything, Thing can actually happen in New York and it does and and again you know like when we did issue I think it was seven. I don't know the one where there's like the fetish club scene so many people are like why is that you know like how did you know you guys get those clothes or how did that come to be and you know but it's like no they're really those places in New York there's you know what I mean it's not unbelievable for anything to kind of happen yeah. that was in there and in new york true. yeah anything's possible there and it just looks cool you know um, I, I have a question where did yeah. the name witchblade come from now here's the thing i don't know if i'm right? pointing to the right person no well here's the thing correct me i might be wrong about this but i remember us sitting in my office right at third street right we're all like around there the table so it was office slash conference room area there and we were we were trying to figure it out right we were writing the names down, and I I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I said Witchblade. Yes, that's exactly. And, and wasn't the reaction <laughs> yeah, bad after we turned him around to that? But I didn't the like reaction was no, there's, there's, there's the origin, like ladies and gentlemen. All right, I'll, I'll trust <laughs> Brian in this, unless he compliments himself. It's I'm not from <laughs> it's from our old D and D role playing superhero games list of character names that you hodgepodge together. My friend Kirk Dilbeck. And I, we set up the gaming shit. And so you like mix names. So okay. it was like, that makes that sense. part and that one, that one, and we, and we did from the list, Witchblade. And you didn't like it at first. 
I didn't like it. Was like it. A day, it was a day before you turned around to it. I thought I, I thought I, I kind of I kind of thought it was your idea at that point. <laughs> I, you know, I thought it was I thought it was Mark's idea. I thought I, blamed, I threw it out there. I blame him, like him for it. it. No, I, I, have really, I have the sheet of paper somewhere. <laughs> really? I thought it was. Yeah. I, thought well, it was I forgot Mark. that too. But I, no, I've no, obviously that was, shown but, but that but I forget David, everything. Come on, when we used to have to kind of make things move there, it's like sometimes. Oh, yeah, we, have to, yeah. we have to we have to make Mark believe this was kind of his idea. Yeah, yes. you're right. Okay. Yes. <laughs> we have to. Because <laughs> you're crushing me right now. I remember we, in one of our, um, we, you know, we tried to reboot uh, Witchblade um, for a, a different TV show, show. And in the pilot that was written for that, there's a, a, a moment where, which is kind of a little bit of a diss, right? Not a little bit. It's like, oh, I read that and went, okay, all right. But literally there's a moment when um, uh, Sarah or someone that she was with, you know, says the name Witchblade. And then the reaction is, huh? And she goes, I didn't think of the name. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, well, so, somebody didn't quite, they weren't on board with it, but that's a good way to, that's a good way to start a pilot. <laughs> that's but pretty yeah, funny. Okay. Yeah, right. That's also just makes me think really fast about like we we're talking about the, the the way she looked before. Um, I don't think I don't remember hearing the story from you in a really long time. The story when uh, when we brought the Witchblade statue to uh, to the meeting at uh, at TNT. Oh God! Like before that. <laughs> I don't even know how much of that I can talk about. To be honest. It just uh, all right. Maybe it's not worth. Yeah. It. It's just showing how we had to fight it. You know, showing how we had to like fight for our vision. Yeah. Wow. And, then, and, then, <laughs> and then there was somebody that was involved with it that, can, that threw that completely out the window in one meeting. All the work of trying to make it not be that character this, visually for TV, mm. and then in one fell swoop, no, oh, this is who it is. Like, oh god, I can't. I can't really talk too much about it. But it's, it's a uh, great story that I tell like in. in, in <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like a great out of control Sorry, Hollywood in a vault. story. Next time yeah. we're in a vault, we'll. Yeah. Where I can name names because <laughs> you have to know who's who it is and like appreciate that. But all right. Um, but yeah, it's like uh, I, I have like even though through all the chaos we talked about this briefly, like good times, bad times, and it's been all that throughout comics, and obviously we're in a, a time that's maybe not good. Um, it's always been filled with drama and chaos, you know, and during that time, and again, maybe I'm looking back through a colored lens, comics, and whether you're living the high life in comics or down the low life of comics, it's always been that way, right? And it's always been chaotic. And now obviously we're all experiencing chaotic times and we're, you know, we're all hoping um, that everything, you know, clears up and we can pull through it and be strong again. Uh, uh, retailers and publishers and fans, we all get what we need and we're all happy again. Yeah, we had a lot right. of fans go on Instagram and and uh, ask a bunch of questions. We covered a lot of it. So again, thanks to all the fans and thanks oh, yeah. to all the retailers. Uh, thanks to, you know, everyone here in this in this call and all the creators of 185 issues of Witchblade. And, and a lot of just, good talent. Yeah, I mean, still working to this day. Um, we mm -hmm. do plan on doing another Kickstarter so if you want to get a cool shirt like this or pins or cool keychains, please, uh, like that. Yeah, right. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll hook you up. We know a guy, so, mm -hmm. or a girl. Uh, so please, yeah. Uh, keep in touch with us on top cow, Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. And uh, we also have a newsletter and a, and a website where we're feeding everybody the information they need to continue to celebrate Witchblade. And I just want to thank everybody, uh, for, for taking the time to hang out and, and look back on one of the most uh, incredible, monumental, independent comics, I think, uh, of all time. So, um, thank you. Yeah, thank and you. I know and, and it's thanks to you guys. You know, I, I, just to reiterate what Henry was saying, and thank you so much. And look, I have nothing but good memories of being with all of you. You know, and I, I will take those, that, I will take those moments right of when we were together right and we were just creating and that's all it was was creating and hanging out because we wanted to right no one forced us to do that we wanted to, all of us wanted to do that and that's a precious memory that i'll take to my grave you know um so thank you all, all of you for making that part that moment in my life so special you know to where even during these days, I can look back and go, wow, 
remember how cool that was, even through the chaos, even through the deadlines, even through this, that, and the other thing. Like, <laughs> it's just the camaraderie, and I want to thank all of you uh, just for being that, that that special part of my life, you thank know, you. and the special part of which we're back and Top Cow and all that. So, because without you guys, honestly, and uh, this is you already know this, but I'm going to say it anyway. Without you guys, none of that, none of that would have happened. You know? so uh, thank Some you of so my much. Some memories. Yeah, right. And you guys, you guys rocked it every day. You rocked it every day. It was a magical period, you yeah. know. I mean, it, it, I, I can't. Imagine, there's nothing like it. What Top Cow was, what Homage was before that. It doesn't exist anymore. And I don't think it will. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's just the world doesn't support that anymore. It was a moment in time. Yeah. You know, that we'll always remember, right? And uh, so thank you guys for that. I, you know, thank Christina, you. it's like great, you. great to see you again after all this time. You know, hopefully we can see each other at shows. Hopefully the shows start up again. And, you know, we should have a top count panel about which way together in front of people. So, uh, but thanks, all of you. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys.